How Nuth Would Have Practiced His Art Upon the Knolls by Lord Dunsany, read by Doug Bolden. Despite the advertisements of rival firms, it is probable that every tradesman knows that nobody in business at the present time has a position equal to that of Mr. Nuth. To those outside the magic circle of business, his name is scarcely known. He does not need to advertise. He is consummate. He is superior even to modern competition, and whatever claims they boast, his rivals know it. His terms are moderate. So much cash down when the goods are delivered. So much in blackmail afterwards. He consults your convenience. His skills may be counted upon. I have seen a shadow on a windy night move more noisily than Nuth, for Nuth is a burglar by trade. Men have been known to stay in country houses and to send a dealer afterwards to bargain for a piece of tapestry that they saw there, some article of furniture, or some picture. This is bad taste, but those whose culture is more elegant invariably send Nuth a night or two after their visit. He has a way with tapestry... You would scarcely notice that the edges had been cut. And often when I see some huge new house full of old furniture and portraits from other ages, I say to myself, these moldering chairs, these full-length ancestors and carved mahogany, they are the produce of the incomparable nut. It may be urged against my use of the word incomparable that in the burglary business the name Slith stands paramount and alone. And of this I am not ignorant, but Slith is a classic, and lived long ago, and knew nothing at all of modern competition. Besides which, the surprising nature of his doom has possibly cast a glamour upon Slith that exaggerates it in our eyes, his undoubted merits. It must not be thought that I am a friend of Nuts, on the contrary. Such politics as I have are on the side of property, and he needs no words from me. His position is almost unique in trade, being among the very few that do not need to advertise. At the time my story begins, Nuth lived in a roomy house on Belgrave Square. In his inimitable way, he had made friends with the caretaker. The place suited Nuth, and whenever anyone came to inspect it before purchase, the caretaker used to praise the house in the words that Nuth had suggested. If it wasn't for the drains, she would say, it's the finest house in London. And when they pounced on this remark and asked questions about the drains, she would answer them that the drains were good, but not so good as the house. They did not see Nuth when they went over the rooms, but Nuth was there. Here in a neat black dress, on one spring morning, came an old woman whose bonnet was lined with red, asking for Mr. Nuth. And with her came her large and awkward son. Mrs. Eggins, the caretaker, glanced up the street, and then she let them in, and left them to wait in the drawing room, a box furniture all mysterious with sheets. For a long while they waited, and then there was the smell of pipe tobacco, and there was Nuth standing quite close to them. Lord, said the old woman, whose bonnet was lined with red, you did make me start. And then she saw by his eyes that this was not the way to speak to Mr. Nuth. And at last Nuth spoke, and very nervously the old woman explained that her son was a likely lad, and that he had been in business already but wanted to better himself, and she wanted Mr. Nuth to teach him a livelihood. First of all, Nuth wanted to see a business reference, and when he was shown one from a jeweler with whom he had happened to be hand in glove, the upshot of it was that he agreed to take young Tonker, for that was the surname of the likely lad, and to make him his apprentice. And the old woman, whose bonnet was lined with red, she went back to her little cottage in the country, and every evening said proudly to her old man, Tonker, we must fasten the shutters of a night time, for Tommy's a burglar now. The details of the likely lad's apprenticeship I do not propose to give. For those that are in the business know the details already, and those that are in other businesses care only for their own. And men of leisure who have no trade at all would fail to appreciate the gradual degrees by which Tommy Tonker first came to cross bare boards covered with little obstacles in the dark without making any sound, and then to go silently up creaky stairs, and then to open doors, and lastly to climb. Let it suffice that the business proffered greatly while the glowing reports of Tommy Tonker's progress were sent from time to time to the old woman whose bonnet was lined with red, in the laborious handwriting of Nuth. 
Noth had given up lessons in writing very early, for he seemed to have some prejudice against forgery, and therefore considered writing a waste of time. And then there came the transaction with Lord Castle Norman at his Surrey residence. Noth selected a Saturday night, for it chanced that Saturday was observed as Sabbath in the family of Lord Castle Norman, and by eleven o'clock the whole house was quiet. Five minutes before midnight, Tommy Tonker, instructed by Mr. Noth, who waited outside, came away with one pocket full of rings and shirt studs. It was quite a light pocket full, but the jewelers in Paris could not match it without sending specially to Africa. So Lord Castle Norman had to borrow bone shirt studs. Not even rumor whispered the name of Noth. Were I to say that this turned his head, there are those to whom the assertion would give pain, for his associates hold that his astute judgment was unaffected by circumstance. I will say, therefore, that it spurred his genius to plan what no burglar had ever planned before. It was nothing less than to burgle the house of the Knolls. And this that abstemious man unfolded to Tonker over a cup of tea. Had Tonker not been nearly insane with pride over their recent transaction, and had he not been blinded by a veneration for Noth, he would have, ah, uh, but I cry over spilled milk. He expostulated respectfully. He said he would rather not go. He said it was not fair. He allowed himself to argue. And in the end, one windy October morning, with a menace in the air, it found him and Noth drawing near to the dreadful wood. Noth, by weighing little emeralds against pieces of common rock, had ascertained the probable weight of those house ornaments that the knolls were believed to possess in the narrow, lofty house wherein they have dwelt from on old. They decided to steal two emeralds and to carry them between them on a cloak. But if they should be too heavy, one must be dropped at once. Noth warned young Tonker against greed and explained that the emeralds were worth less than cheese until they were safe away from the dreadful wood. Everything had been planned and they now walked in silence. No track led up to the sinister gloom of trees, either of men or cattle. Not even a poacher had been there, snaring elves for over a hundred years. You did not trespass twice in the dwell of the knolls. And apart from the things that were done there, the trees themselves were a warning and did not wear the wholesome look of those that we plant ourselves. The nearest village was some miles away, with the backs of all of its houses turned to the wood, and without one single window at all facing in that direction. They did not speak of it there, and elsewhere it is unheard of. Into this wood stepped Nuth and Tommy Tonker. They had no firearms. Tonker had asked for a pistol, but Nuth replied that the sound of a shot would bring everything down on us, and no more was said about it. Into the wood they went all day, deeper and deeper. They saw the skeleton of some early Georgian poacher nailed to a door in an oak tree. Sometimes they saw a fairy scuttle away from them. Once, Tonker stepped heavily on a hard, dry stick after which they were both laying still for several minutes. And the sunset flared full of omens through the tree trunks, and night fell, and they came by fitful starlight as Nuth had foreseen to that lean, high house where the knolls so secretly dwelt. All was so silent by that unvalued house that the faded courage of Tonker flickered up a bit. But to Nuth's experience since, it was too silent. And all the while there was that look in the sky that was worse than spoken doom, so that Noth, as is often the case when men are met in doubt, had leisure to fear the worst. Nevertheless, he did not abandon the business, but sent the likely lad with the instruments of his trade by means of the ladder to the old green casement. And the moment that Tonker touched the withered boards, the silence that, though ominous, was earthly, became unearthly, like the touch of a ghoul. And Tonker heard his breath offending against that silence, and his heart was like mad drums on a night attack, and a string of one of his sandals went tap on the rung of the ladder, and the leaves of the forest were mute, and the breeze of the night was still, and Tonker prayed that a mouse or a mole might make any noise at all, but not a creature stirred. Even Nuth was still. And then and there, while yet he was undiscovered, the likely lad made up his mind, as he should have done long before, to leave those colossal emeralds where they were and have nothing further to do with that lean high house of the knolls, to quit the sinister wood in the nick of time and retire from business at once and buy a place in the country. 
Then he descended softly and beckoned to Nam. But the gnolls had watched him through the knavish holes they bore in the trunks of trees, and the unearthly silence gave way, as if it were with a grace, to the rapid screams of Tonker as they picked him up from behind, screams that came faster and faster. until they were incoherent. And where they took him, it is not good to ask, and what they did with him, I shall not say. Nuth looked on for a while from the corner of the house with a mild surprise on his face as he rubbed his chin, for the trick of the hole in the trees was new to him. Then he stole nimbly away through the dreadful woods. And did they catch Nuth? You might ask me, gentle reader. Oh no, my child. Nobody ever catches nothing.